Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Twi Nguyen. I'm general counsel for the Peralta Community College District. It is an absolute honor for me to be here with you this evening. Uh, when I was advocating for the Peralta Colleges in Washington, D.C. earlier this year, I had a conversation with a couple folks in D.C. about this incredible congressman named John Lewis. And we talked about how important it is for our students to learn about this great man. As the only living speaker from the March on Washington at the ripe age of 23, with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself, Congressman Lewis was once again present on the stage at another historical moment, the inauguration of President Barack Obama. President Obama signed a commemorative photograph for the congressman with the words on that photograph, because of you, John, Barack Obama. Because of you, John. <laughs> Thus, when I saw Congressman Lewis on our, as our featured speaker for the lecture series, uh, I signed up right away. Never did I think that I would have the honor and privilege to be here to moderate this auspicious occasion. Thank you for having me here today. Where? Thank you. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? The title of our lecture tonight, Find a Way to Get in the Way. Find a way to get in the way. <laughs> Tonight, we will hear from the great John Lewis and how he found a way to get in the way. We will hear history and his story. Cornell West once said that no other elected official in America embodies the grand legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. more than John Lewis. Our next two speakers will help set the stage for Congressman Lewis, and they really need no introduction. The Honorable Elihu Harris is no stranger to Oakland. He is so widely respected in the state legislature that they named the state building in Oakland after him. At one point, if you went to the Oakland Zoo, you would meet a lion, Elihu, also named after him. He's quite a lion, too. I often meet people who tell me how much Elihu Harris has done for Oakland, oftentimes deeds that may not be publicly known, I think in large part due to his very nature of nev never tooting his own horn. Elihu Harris received his BA in political science from Cal State East Bay, well, Cal State Hayward at the time, MA in Public Policy at UC Berkeley, and a law degree at UC Davis School of Law, also commonly known as King Hall, after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. At the ripe age of 32, Mr. Harris was elected to the California State Assembly and served for 12 years. It was there that he authored the historic 1981 legislation designating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday a California state holiday. Now mind you, it was the first in the country to do so even before the federal government. In 1991, he was then elected mayor of Oakland where he served the full two-year term. Elihu Harris has a mind of a genius. I've had the incredible honor of working with him when he was chancellor for seven years, the longest tenured chancellor at Peralta Community College District. I saw firsthand the love he had for the community, his strong sense of public service, and the sheer brilliance of how he solves problems and engages people. I am truly blessed to have him as a mentor he just introduced me to the congresswoman, uh, the congressman uh, Lee uh, Lewis, as uh, well, Congresswoman Lee and Congressman Lewis. 
as, uh, as his protege, and I'm very honored uh, that he would consider me that. I very much consider him a friend. Please help me welcome, larger than life, Ellie Hugh Harris. Thank you very much. We thank you for the kind introduction. The first thing I want to tell you, though, is the lion was indeed named Ella Hugh Harris. The bad news is the lion is dead. <laughs> you know, I want to mention a couple other people. Bernard Tyson, you know, when I, I was a baby, I was the Kaiser baby. And it was really interesting, because when I was the baby, there were no black folks working at Kaiser. It was hard getting in Kaiser. So they have a president and COO of Kaiser is really something that I think all of us should kind of be proud of. But a real testament to what people can do when they're willing to struggle and overcome adversity and racism. You know, we are here today because we want to make sure that none of us, those who were alive during the Civil Rights Movement, and for our children to ever forget the legacy that we have witnessed, that we have inherited, and the debt that we must repay to those who paved the bridges across which we now travel. It's not an accident that Congressman Lewis is here. He came here not because he had to, not because he's campaigning uh, in co for Congress here, he came because he cares about the struggle for justice and equality, and that we know that if we're going to overcome the reality of racism and economic oppression, we have to always be vigilant. We have to always struggle. We have to always be in the fight for the things we believe in and for our children. But if we, have, if we lose the fight for our children, why have we lived? Martin Luther King, one of his greatest quotes to me was, a person who's not found something for which he is willing to die, is not fit to live. We must live for our children. We don't have to die for them. We have to live for the next generation because we have inherited the dream that Martin had left to us in 1968. Let me say something else. You know, we have been blessed by incredible leaders in our community and across the country. And when we begin to understand what our children don't fully understand, then we have to teach them. We have to make sure that they understand that we didn't get here by accident. It was because not only somebody had a dream, because people struggle and die and continue to struggle to make this a better place for all of us. Now, I was chancellor of Peralta, and I want to thank a few people at Peralta. The current chancellor was Allen, uh, Bobby Adams, the former president of Merritt, uh, I also want to thank Eric Gravenberg, uh, the Vice President of Student Services. Everybody's part of the Merritt family for keeping them alive. You know, Merritt was, uh, you, as you might know, the home of the Black Panthers. It was really a place where protest and radicalism took place in Oakland. But a lot of things were going on in the South. We had our own civil rights leaders here in Oakland who were struggling against racism, police brutality, and so many other things. They led their lives on the line for that. Whether you agree with what the Panthers did or not, understand the purpose for which they did it was to deal with justice and equality. And for that, we all owe a debt of gratitude. <laughs> the tweet mentioned that I carried the Martin Luther King holiday bill. And I want you to know that I'm proud of that. What most of you don't know was, when California was supposed to be the liberal state uh, that we all thought was so wonderful, I remember I asked a Democratic legislator if he would support the bill. And I want to give you his direct quote. Ella, you, I'd love to support the bill, but if they have a holiday for a nigga, the next thing I want is a holiday for a Mexican. I hope you've come a long way since then. But what he said, a lot of people still feel and believe. So we can't turn our backs just because people are nicer or because they smile at us. We have to try to change hearts and minds, not just 
the public respect. And I want to comment on one more, Gene Kwan. Gene Kwan's got a tough job, I know, because I have. And a lot of times, people think that the mayor is in charge of solving the city's problems. I beg to differ. The city is responsible for solving the city's problems. She can provide leadership, but we all have to get behind her. We all have to change our neighborhoods. We all have got to, pray, to not only pray for peace and the end of violence and uh, brutality uh, in our community, we have to work for it as well. That's why the Martin Luther King program is so important. Not only is it emphasizing conflict resolution, uh, not only is it teaching people about the legacy of Martin Luther King and struggle, but it's also giving young people a sense of purpose, a sense of history, and more important, a sense of a common future in a community which we all care about each other, love each other, and trust each other, and working for each other's betterment. That's why the Martin Luther King program is so important. If you have the chance to hear each of the young people who participate in that program, you would not fear for the future of our community. These are the kind of leaders that are being taught, that are being transformed, and that are changing Oakland. Have faith in that reality, because that is the future we all are dreaming and fighting for. And they're not getting by on a lot of money. Congresswoman Lee fought to get it established. She's gotten earmarks, but earmarks are still available for the Martin Luther King program to get a stable base. But it's now living on a shoestring. So for those of you who contributed tonight, I want to personally thank you, because you're helping to keep the dream alive. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Two more things that I'm going to sit down. I love Barbara Lee. You know, there is no one, no one, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not going to include Congressman Lewis in this, but nobody else that fights hard, that gives more for their district and the nation than Barbara Lee. I'm not going to tell you how far back, because she's not as old as my memory has it. Uh, but Barbara has been a leader in civil rights since she was, in, I know since she was in college, when she was working for Shirley Chisholm, when she was involved in Ron Dellum's office, when she was involved in politics. I, let me tell you, when I was in the State Assembly, every, almost every year, Barbara would come up to me and say, when are you going to get out of my seat? <laughs> I mean, she, was, she told me she was going to take it if I didn't hurry up and get out of it. That's the only reason I ran for me. <laughs> I didn't want to lose to Barbara Lee. But Barbara Lee uh, is so dedicated and committed and so, such a conscious person. I want to tell you something. Everybody knows and recognizes she, she was the lone vote against the war and the presence of power for doing this But I take pride in telling you this. The night before the vote, Barbara called me after she'd come back from the National Cathedral. And she said, I prayed on this, I thought about this, and I've been getting death threats and all kinds of things. But I can't vote to give that man war powers. I'm not going to do it. I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care if I lose my seat in Congress, but I have to do my moral best and do what I was sent here to do, and then fight the evil powers and tell truth to power. She did it. We're proud. We're grateful. And we all want to understand what kind of congresswoman we are fighting for in Washington, D.C.
And now, and now for our speaker. You know, I remember when I was a teenager looking at the March on Washington and seeing somebody that wasn't much older than I was who was standing up and speaking on the issues of our time, talking about how change was going to come, how it was going to be effectuated, and let me know that even though the civil rights movement seemed to be in the South, those of us who wanted to be involved in the decision-making process and the allocation of resources and change had to do something here where we are. It's like acting locally and thinking globally. That's when I first met Gene Kwan. I was going to Cal. We were fighting for ethnic studies. Yeah. We, in fact, believed that civil rights had to start where you are. Right. You know, they, we had just as much racism and prejudice as anybody else. We were, just weren't getting lynched and beat as often and certainly as publicly as John Lewis and the civil rights leaders were uh, throughout the southern part of this country. But he demonstrated that you don't just fight and sit down. You fight and you keep on fighting. You stand up for what you believe in. You fight for justice. You fight for equality. You fight to make sure that people who had no voice are spoken for and spoken for loudly and clearly. He has done that as a member of Congress. He has done that as a civil rights leader. His life is a tribute to the legacy that justice and equality is only ours if we stand up and fight for it. So I'm so proud that you joined us in this lecture series. Congressman John Lewis, we welcome you to open it. We thank you for the leadership you've demonstrated. We will follow your example. We want to make sure that your legacy as Martin Luther King's will also be one that we take to heart for the remainder of our life. Thank you. of greatness. We are in the presence of greatness, not only with Elihu Harris and Congressman John Lewis, but our next speaker who will introduce the congressman. Congresswoman Barbara Lee is a legend in her own right. Many of us know her for her courage of conviction and voting record against war. Some of us may not know that she grew up in extreme poverty and intimately understands the power of standing up against obstacles. She personally knows the physical and emotional pain of domestic violence. In the United States Congress, Congresswoman Barbara Lee is a valid fighter for peace, health care, jobs, and justice for all. She is a fighter for educational opportunities for young people. I have seen firsthand her tenacity and advocacy for community colleges. She doesn't just show her support for community colleges, she guides and leads us to the water. She does everything in her power to make sure we can serve our students well. Do you know of any elected official who has a name, who has her name in an actual slogan? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Barbara Lee, speak for me. Barbara Lee, speak for me. let's hear it one more time. Barbara Lee, speak for me. let's hear and let's hear her speak. Please help me welcome Congresswoman Barbara Lee. doing all the heavy lifting tonight for us and for your tremendous leadership. Thank all of you for coming out this evening for what will be an inspirational and amazing moment for the 9th Congressional District. Thank you, Mayor Kwan, for joining us once again in these lecture series. And I want to thank all of you for your ongoing support, 
I have to just thank all of our sponsors, and Bernard, thank you so much, and Kaiser Permanente, and all of you for really helping to do this. This is such an important effort in this community, and we thank you for being here tonight also. And let me just first say it's such an honor to represent such a spirited and enlightened and diverse and progressive community. Thank you. It's an honor to be your representative. Thank you. Pastor Haynes, let me just thank you for opening this beautiful sanctuary and for your bold and your brilliant leadership and for your service to this great congregation and to this great community. Also, let me thank my friend and colleague, former mayor and Peralta Chancellor Elihu Harris for co-sponsoring this lecture series, but most importantly for your friendship and for your counsel. And Elihu and I, we do go back to the day. And I tell you, you know, and I know Elihu, and, and I tell you, Sheila, thank you so much. You know, I know she, Elihu's wife, Sheila, I know you thought he was really retiring, right? Uh, <laughs> But I have to appreciate, thank you and salute you, Sheila, for everything that you do each and every day in this community, in your own right. But Elihu could be um, playing golf every day, but he is still working on so many fronts for our young people, for a better world and for change in this community. And you all know Elihu is a visionary who has many, many dreams. I mean, every day when we talk, it's another dream, another vision he has. But more importantly, he is determined. He is determined to make those dreams come true. So give Pastor Hames and Elihu a round of applause again for me, because I really love you both and thank you so much. And to the Martin Luther King Freedom Center, to our young people, our children, they helped organize this lecture series and are a true force in this community for nonviolence and for civic participation. And I have to just say to the directors, Karen and to Roy, thank you so much for staying the course and thank you for your amazing and dedicated work for peace and justice. And to our young people, you make me so proud. You make me so proud. And of course, to Merritt College, and to Dean Herring, and to Bobby, and to Wise, and to the entire Peralta and Merritt family, I just want to thank you and your students for co-sponsoring this lecture series, and really for providing a very stellar education for our young people and older people for the jobs of today and for tomorrow. Let's once again give uh, our sponsors, Merritt College and the Freedom Center and our young people a round of applause. I just have to salute all of you so much for this. And I have to thank my staff, Sandra Andrews, and my entire staff. They go so far beyond the call of duty. Stand up, Sandra. I know you don't want to do it. Chantel, all of you who are here, thank you for your tremendous work. They work 24-7 for this community. And to the congregation here, uh, I just have to thank you for your hospitality and generosity. This is such a historic church and has meant so much to the life of this community. And I've had the privilege to bring many of our great leaders to this church, including my mentor, the first African-American woman elected to Congress, the late, our beloved Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. She spoke right here, right here where I'm standing on two occasions on two occasions. And we brought a fighter for peace and justice, our beloved, the late Senator Edward Kennedy. He spoke right here from this pulpit, right here. And tonight, we have an icon of the civil rights movement, one who made so many sacrifices so that we could have the right to vote, one who fought for an end to segregation, the Honorable John Lewis. And I just have to just say, John, you know, the Faith and Politics Institute, and this is how all of this got started. This was a vision we had. I'm privileged to participate with John Lewis on the civil rights pilgrimages every year to Montgomery, Selma, and Birmingham. I have the privilege and honor with my young people who come with me to meet the sheroes and the heroes of the civil rights movement who walked and talked with Dr. King and Congressman Lewis 
And I, every year I think, how in the world can everyone in my district get a chance to get a glimpse of what I've learned and who I've met and what their legacy is and what they're continuing to do? And so Ella Hugh and I talked in the Freedom Center and Merritt, and we said, let's do a lecture series. And so we've had this year only, we've had uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian, all of these are great, great people who paved the way for us today. We've had Dr. Dorothy Cotton and Bob Zellner and Jack O'Dell. We've had so many people. And I wanted this community to really hear, one, about the struggles that they went through, the sacrifices that they made, but you know what? How they didn't turn back. They did not turn back. No way did they turn back. And no, they did not get weary, Bernard. They did not get weary. They're still fighting for peace and justice. So we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. And so Congressman Lewis has come here to inspire us and to remind us that the fight is not over and that our young people must pick up the baton and continue the work for equality and justice and nonviolence, as the Congressman always says and calls for the beloved community. In closing, let me just take a moment of personal privilege and just say this. I grew up in El Paso, Texas. Uh, segregation was alive and well, couldn't go to public schools. And my mother is here with me tonight. Mother, I want you to stand up, Mildred Massey, because she was one of the first black students. She was out of five students. John, it's because of you that she was able to best open the University of Texas. It was then called uh, Texas Western, but she was one of the five first five students to integrate the University of Texas in El Paso after desegregation, after desegregation. So John, we all owe you a debt of gratitude. We owe you a debt of gratitude. We will never forget. And in, on, and in repaying you this debt of gratitude, it's up to us to move forward, to pick up that baton, and to continue to fight the good fight. I have to just thank you again for spending some time with us this evening. He's been here for two days. He didn't have to come. You know, he could do other things right now, especially during campaign season. But he came to Oakland, California to talk about with us those very treacherous but those very important moments and times in history. He came to talk about also the unfinished business in America because we've got to reignite the American dream for all. And Congressman John Lewis is a living legend who is helping to reignite the American dream for all God's children. Give Congressman John Lewis a round of applause, our hero, our warrior, one who walked and talked with Dr. Martin Luther King, one who I get the privilege to sit to next to each and every day and be inspired by. Barbara Lee, <laughs> my God, <laughs> Pastor Hain, thank you, my brother, for making this beautiful sanctuary available for this meeting. I said to Barbara Lee a few moments ago, this reminds me more of a mass meeting that we held in the heart of the Deep South right. during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. I'm honored, I'm delighted. I feel more than lucky, but very blessed to be here. And Barbara, I wanna thank you for inviting me to be here. Madam Mayor, honorable elected officials, <coughs> Mayor Harris, my beloved brothers and sisters, it is good to be in Oakland. Right. It is good to be here. It, it is very good to be in California. My, uh, by inviting me here, Barbara, you presented me with an opportunity to visit and see my uh, baby sister who live in Richmond, 
and be living here with her husband, Wallace Turner, my sister Rosa, and her son, their son Marcus. It's good to see you. You all can stand and from Alabama. <laughs> now Barbara heard me say this, and Barbara, I want to tell you, each and every one of you, you should be very proud of your member of Congress. Barbara Lee is the best. She is a fighter. She is a warrior. She has the ability and the capacity to speak truth to power. She is wonderful. She is smart. She is gifted. And you need to send her back to Washington over and over and over again. We need her. Now, I didn't grow up in a big city like Oakland. I didn't grow up in a big city like Washington, D.C., or New York, or Atlanta. I grew up on a farm in rural Alabama. 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. My sister would tell you that my father had been a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four. How many of you remember when you was four? Well, what happened to the rest of us? My father had saved $300, and with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. My family is still on that land today in rural Alabama. <laughs> on this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and corn, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. We did. I know. Many of you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> some of you raise a little fuss sometime. Some of you can uh, bring about a little drama, but you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> but let me tell you, as a little boy growing up in rural Alabama during the 40s and the 50s, it was my responsibility to care for the chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens. I had to take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Some of you may be saying, now John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest, and there would be some more eggs. Do you follow me? You don't follow me. <laughs> when these little chicks would hatch, I would fool these setting hens. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks, give them to another hen, or put them in a box with a lantern, raise them on their own, get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under this setting hen, encourage the setting hen to stay on the nest for another three weeks. I kept on fooling and cheating on these setting hens. And when I look back on it, it was not the right thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most nonviolent thing to do. It was not the most democratic thing to do. But I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive hatcher or incubator from this Sizzle Robux store. Now, I know all of you weren't born in California. I, I know that. Uh, you don't have to tell me. I, and today, I saw a Sizzle Robux store a Sears store downtown? Yeah. Are any of you old enough to remember the Sizzle Robot catalog? Yeah. You really do? Yeah. That, that big, thick book? Yeah. Some people call it the ordering book. Yeah. And some of us call it the whoosh book. I wish I had this, I wish I had that. <laughs> but I just kept on wishing. <laughs> Pastor Haynes, you know, as a young boy, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach the gospel. So from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters and my first cousins, 
I would gather all of my chickens together in the chicken yard, like together here in the sanctuary. And my brothers and sisters and cousins would line the outside of the chicken yard for to help make up the audience, the congregation. And I would start speaking and preaching. And when I look back on it, some of these chickens would bow their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listen to me today in the Congress. Now your Congress, now your Congress person, Congresswoman Barbara Lee is an exception. And some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. Well, that's enough of that. When we would visit the little town of Troy, when we would visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, visit Birmingham, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. As a young child, I tasted the bitter fruits of segregation and racial discrimination, and I didn't like it. I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why segregation, why racial discrimination? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, at the age of 15, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard Dr. King speaking on the old radio. The leadership of Dr. King, his words, the action of Rosa Parks inspired me to find a way to get in the way. I got in trouble. It was good trouble. It was necessary trouble. Barbara Lee, Mayor Harris, been getting in trouble. I have the feeling that here, Today, we're too quiet. We're too quiet. We need to make some noise. We need to find a way to get in the way. We need to find a way to get in good trouble, necessary trouble, if we're going to save America and create the beloved community. We can do it. I know some of the young people, not the young people that have been to Birmingham, to Montgomery, to Selma. Not the young people that are part of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. But many, many young people and some others are asking, John Lewis, how do you get involved? How do you meet Martin Luther King Jr.? When I finished high school in May of 1957, at the age of 17, I wanted to attend a little school 10 miles from my home called Troy State College, now known as Troy University. Submitted my application, my high school transcript. I never heard a word from the college. So I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I didn't tell my mother or father, any of my brothers or sisters, any of my teachers. I told Dr. King I needed his help. I needed his support. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote me back, sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket, and invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. I went off to school to Nashville. And after being in Nashville for just a few weeks, maybe about three weeks, I told one of my teachers that I've been in contact with Martin Luther King Jr. This teacher was a schoolmate of Dr. King at Morehouse College in Atlanta. He informed Dr. King that I was there. When I was home for spring break, I took a bus ride from Troy to Montgomery. A young African-American lawyer by the name of Fred Gray, who was a lawyer for Rosa Parks, for Dr. King, and the Montgomery Movement, and later became our lawyer during the Freedom Ride and during the march from Selma to Montgomery, met me at the Greyhound bus station and drove me to the First Baptist Church. Pastor by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, a colleague of Dr. King. He ushered me into the pastor's study. I saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy standing behind a desk. 
I was so scared. I didn't know what to say or what to do. And Dr. King spoke up and said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said to Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave my whole name. And that was the beginning of my involvement in the Civil Rights Movement. I continued to study in Nashville. And it was in Nashville that a group of students started studying the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. We started studying about what Dr. King was all about in Montgomery. Started studying what Gandhi attempted to do in South Africa and what he accomplished in India. We studied the role in civil disobedience. Then we had role playing, social drama. And then we started sitting in at lunch counters and restaurants. We sitting there in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, waiting to be served. And someone would come up and spit on us, or put a lighted cigarette up in our hair or down our backs. Pull us off the lunch counter stool, beat us. But we believe in the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. We were prepared to die while we were sitting on those lunch counter stools. We got arrested and went to jail. We were beaten over and over again, but we didn't strike back. We came with the philosophy of love and peace and nonviolence. We wanted to create the beloved community. We wanted to redeem the soul of America. We wanted to create a city, a community at peace with itself. The way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence is a more excellent way. Yes, my folks said, don't get in trouble. Don't get in the way. I got in the way. I got in trouble. So for more than 50 years, I've been getting in trouble, and I'm going to get in some more trouble as a member of Congress. It's time for us to get in trouble. Just think, just think, the same year that President Barack Obama was born in 1961, black people and white people couldn't be seated together on a bus leaving Washington, D.C. to go into Virginia through North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, on our way to New Orleans. We were beaten, left bloody, unconscious by mobs. arrested in jail in Jackson, Mississippi. Young people, college professors, and lawyers came from California and went to jail with us. We were sent to Parchment State Penitentiary. We didn't give up. We didn't give in. We didn't become bitter. We didn't become hostile. We kept a faith, and we kept our eyes on the prize. We hadn't heard of the internet. We didn't have a website. We didn't have an iPad. We didn't have a fax machine. We had an old mimeograph machine. But through our action, we reformed, we liberated a society. We created a nonviolent revolution, a revolution of values, a revolution of ideas. And because of hundreds and thousands of young people and people from all across America, young and old, black and white, Latino, Asian American, and Native American. Our country is a better country, and we are a better people, and we must never, ever forget that. Just think, in 1963, when I was only 23 years old, had all of my hair, <laughs> few pounds lighter, 
I became head of one of the major civil rights organizations, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, better known as SNCC. It was my duty and my responsibility to be one of the organizers and later one of the speakers at the March on Washington. While I was working on that speech in Atlanta and later in New York and in Washington, I was reading a copy of the New York Times and I saw a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. And in that speech, I said something like, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours, too. It must be ours. Our black brothers and sisters in Alabama and Georgia, 11 states that old Confederacy, from Virginia to Texas, many could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. People had to pay a poll tax, interpret certain section of the Constitution, on one occasion, a man was asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap. On another occasion, a man was asked to count the number of jelly beans in a jar. There were black lawyers, black doctors, college professors, high school principals and teachers were told they could not read or write well enough. Back in 1963 and 64, the state of Mississippi had a black voting age population of more than 450,000, and only about 16,000 were registered to vote. One county in my native state of Alabama, between Selma and Montgomery, the county was more than 80% African American, but not a single registered African American voter. We had to change that. I remember when the march on Washington was all over, after the ten of us spoken, after Dr. King has said, I have a dream today, a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. President Kennedy invited us back to the White House, and we stood in the door of the Oval Office, he did, and greeted each one of us. He said, you did a good job, you did a good job, you did a good job. He was like a proud father, and everything had gone so well. And when he got to Dr. King, he said, and you had a dream. But after the march was over, 18 days later, it was a terrible bombing of the church in Birmingham, Alabama, where four little girls were killed on Sunday morning. That was a sad and dark hour for the movement. It tore at the essence of our hearts. Again, we didn't become bitter. We kept the faith. We kept our eyes on the prize. We organized something called the Mississippi Summer Project, where more than a thousand students, many came from California, teaching in the freedom schools, trying to prepare people to pass the so-called literacy test. And three young men that I knew, Andy Goodman, Mika Schreiner from New York City, and James Shaney from Mississippi, went out on the summer night of June 21st, 1964, to investigate the burning of an African-American church. The church was used for voter registration workshop. These three young men were stopped by the sheriff, arrested, taken to jail, taken out of jail, turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, shot, and killed. And I said to you tonight, Oakland, these three young men didn't die in Vietnam. They didn't die in the Middle East. They didn't die in Eastern Europe. They didn't die in Central or South America. They died right here in our own country, trying to get all of our people to become participants in the democratic process. That's why we got to go out and vote like we never, ever voted before. We got to use the vote. Use the vote. Their bodies were discovered six weeks later, buried under a mound of dirt. President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 
On July 2nd, 1964, he won a landslide election in November 64. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. received the Nobel Peace Prize in December 1964. He come back to America, hold a meeting with President Johnson at the White House and tell the president, we need a voting rights site. President Lyndon Johnson said to Dr. King in so many words, I just signed a civil rights site, Dr. King. We don't have the votes in the Congress to get a voting rights site passed. Dr. King came back to Atlanta, met with a group of us, and said we were right that act. And he made a decision to join us in Selma, Alabama. In Selma, Alabama, only 2.1% of blacks of voting age were registered to vote. You had a sheriff there. He was a mean man. He wore a gun on one side, a nightstick on the other side. He carried an electric cap product in his hand, and he didn't use it on cows. He wore a button on his left lapel that said, never. When it was my day to lead a group of black citizens down to the courthouse, you can only attempt to register on the first and third Mondays of each month, and you had to go to the courthouse. He met us at the top of the steps, January the 18th, 1965. He looked at me and he said, John Lewis, you're an outside agitator, and you're the lowest form of humanity. I looked at the chef and I said, chef, I may be an agitator, but I'm not an outsider. I grew up only 90 miles from here, and we're going to stay here until these people are allowed to register to vote. And he said, you're under arrest. And he took more than 60 of us to jail. A few days later, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Abernathy, and others came to Selma, and more than 300 people were arrested, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We filled the city jail, the county jail, the city stockade. And then, about two weeks later, in a little town called Marion, Alabama, in the heart of the Black Belt, the home of Mrs. Coretta Scott King, there was a protest one evening. A young man by the name of Jimmy Lee Jackson, a veteran, tried to protect his mother. He was shot in his stomach by a state trooper and died a few days later in Selma. And because of what happened to him, we made a decision, the movement did, that we will march from Selma to Montgomery to dramatize to the nation and to the world that the people, not only in Alabama, but throughout the South, wanted to register to vote. Sunday after church, we left Round Chapel AME Church. We lined up in twos, 600 of us. One young man by the name of Jose Williams from Dr. King's organization, we asked to lead it to march on behalf of SCLC, and I was asked to lead it on behalf of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. During those days, I was wearing a backpack before it became fashionable to wear backpacks. <laughs> I thought we were going to be arrested and that we were going to go to jail. So in this backpack, I had two books. I wanted to have something to read in jail. I had an apple and I had an orange. I wanted to have something to eat. One apple and one orange wouldn't last that long. Since I was going to be in jail with my friends, my colleagues, and neighbors, I had toothpaste and toothbrush. I wanted to be able to brush my teeth. We get to the edge of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, crossing the Alabama River. Jose William looked at me and said, John, can you swim? I said, no. And I said, Jose, can you swim? He said, yes, a little. I said, well, there's too much water down there. We're not going to jump. We're going to continue to walk, to march. And we continue to march. We came to the highest point on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Down below, we saw a sea of blue, Alabama State Troopers. And behind the State Troopers, you saw Sheriff Clark Posse. He had requested that all white men over the age of 21 to come down to the courthouse the night before to be deputized to become part of the posse to stop the march. 
became within hearing distance of the state troopers. And a man spoke up and said, I'm Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers. This was an unlawful march. It would not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse and return to your church. Jose said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. And the Major said, Troopers advance. You saw these men putting on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks, bull whips, shrimping us with horses, releasing the tear gas. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. Had a concussion at the bridge. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. 47 years later, I don't recall how I made it across that bridge back to that little church. The church is full to capacity. More than 2,000 people on the outside trying to get in to protest what has happened. But someone asked me while we were there in the church to say something to the audience. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it how President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam and cannot send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect people who wanted to register to vote. The next, thing, the next thing I knew, I had been admitted to the local hospital. And early that next morning, that Monday morning, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came by to visit me. And he said, don't worry, John. Don't worry. We will make it from Selma to Montgomery, and the Voting Rights Act will be passed. He said that he had requested religious leaders, ministers, priests, and rabbis, and nuns, the country Selma. Tuesday, March night, more than a thousand priests, ministers, rabbis, and nuns came to Selma and marched to the point where we were beaten two days earlier. And that afternoon, a group of ministers went out trying to get something to eat. And they were jumped by members of the Klan. And one young minister from Boston was so severely beaten. He died two days later at a hospital in Birmingham. And because of what happened to him and to others, there was a sense of righteous indignation all across America. There was demonstration in more than 80 cities. At the White House, the Department of Justice, President Lyndon Johnson was, was forced to act. He called Governor Wallace, the governor of Alabama, to come to Washington to meet with him. And the governor could not assure the president that he would protect us, that he could protect us. So President Johnson spoke to the nation, and in my estimation, gave one of the most meaningful speeches any American president had given in modern time on the whole question of civil rights and voting rights. We call it the We Shall Overcome speech, March 15th. He spoke to a joint session of the Congress. He started that speech off that night by saying, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and for the destiny of democracy. He went on to say, at time, history and fate meet in a single place in man unending search for freedom. So it was more than a century ago at Lexington and at Concord. So it was at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. He condemned the violence in Selma. And before he concluded that speech, he said, and we shall overcome. That was the first time hearing an American president using the theme song of the Civil Rights Movement. I was sitting next to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As we watched and listened to Lyndon Johnson, I looked at Dr. King and tears came down his face. He started crying and we all cried. And Dr. King said again, we will make it from Selma to Montgomery. The Voting Rights Act would be passed. The Congress debated the act. It was passed and signed into law on August 6, 1965. If it weren't for the Voting Rights Act, weren't for the support of hundreds and thousands and millions of American citizens, there would be no Barack Obama as President of the United States today. So people ask me over and over again, 
whether the election of President Barack Obama is the fulfillment of Dr. King's dream. I said, no, it's just a down payment. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're not there. We're not there. We have a lot of work to do. Too many, too many of our people have been left out. They're black people, they're white people, they're Latino, they're Asian American, they're Native American, they're straight, they're gay. They've been left out and left behind. We must not rest. We must not be patient until all of our people can participate. We must never, never, ever stop. We cannot stop now. You know, I went to jail 40 times during the 60s. Left bloody and unconscious at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery in May of 1961 during the Freedom Ride. Almost died on that bridge. I gave a little blood. And I'm not tired, I'm not in any way tired. And none of us, not one of us, can afford to be tired. Don't get weary. Hang in there. We got to hang in there. We got to do it not just for ourselves, for our children. Not just for this generation, but for generation yet unborn. We got to leave this little planet, leave this little piece of real estate a little greener, a little cleaner, and a little more peaceful. We got to do it. As Barbara Lee, as Barbara Lee was saying, as Barbara Lee was saying, we got to start spending so much of our limited resources on bombs and missiles and guns. <laughs> Feed our children. Take care of our seniors. Save the environment. We have a right to know what is in the food we eat. We have a right to know what is in the water we drink. We have a right to know what is in the air we breathe. We can do it. We can do it. Now let me finish by telling you a little story. And I'll be finished. Barbara, let me have a little water. I want to tell this story. I just want to tell this little story. And I'll be finished. Pastor Haim, I'll be finished. When I was growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, I had an aunt by the name of Seneva. And my aunt Seneva lived in what we call a shotgun house. I know here in Oakland, here in California, you never seen a shotgun house. You don't even know what I'm talking about. I was born in a shotgun house. My aunt Seneva didn't have a green manicured lawn, had a simple, plain dirt yard. For those of you who mean, well, you've never seen a shotgun house. You've you just never seen one. You don't even know what I'm talking about. My Aunt Seneva, old shotgun house, sometime at night you can look up through the holes in the ceiling through the holes in the tin roof and count the stars. When it rains, she may get a pail, a bucket, a tub, and catch the rainwater. From time to time, she would walk out into the woods and cut branches from a dogwood tree and tie these branches together and make a broom. And she called that broom the breast broom. She would walk out and sweep this dirt yard very clean, sometimes two and three times a week, especially on a Friday or Saturday, because she wanted that dirt yard to look very good on the weekend. But those of you who may not know what a shotgun house is, really, you don't know what it is. But in a nonviolent sense, a shotgun house, an old house, one way in, one way out, where you can bounce a basketball through the front door and it will go straight out the back door. My aunt Sunniva lived in a shotgun house. 
But one Saturday afternoon, a group of my brothers and sisters and a few of my first cousins, about 12 or 15 of us young children, while playing in my Aunt Seneva dirt yard, and an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, and the lightning started flashing. My aunt became terrified. She got all of us little children together and told us to hold hands, and we did as we were told. The wind continued to blow, the thunder continued to roll, the lightning continued to flash, and the rain continued to beat on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. And we cried and we cried. We thought this old house was going to blow away. So when one corner of this old house appeared to be lifting from its foundation, my aunt had us to walk to that side to try to hold the house down with our little body. When the other corner appeared to be lifting, my aunt had us to walk to that corner to try to hold the house down with our little body. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never, ever left the house. Called it the house of Oakland. Called it the house of Atlanta or Washington or New York. We all live in the same house. Maybe our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships but we're all in the same boat now. We're all in the same boat now. We got to look out for each other. We got to care for each other. We got to love each other. Dr. King used to say from time to time, just love the hell out of everybody. Just love. Love is a better way. The way of peace, the way of love. Let's build one house. Let's create in this old house, the American house, a beloved community, a truly multiracial democratic society where no one is left out or left behind, where we respect the dignity and the worth of every human being. So I said to you tonight, Oakland, walk with Barbara Lee. Walk with the wind and let the spirit of our country and the Martin Luther King Freedom Center be your guide. Thank you very much. Thank you.